this Christian cross from Ireland would have worked like a victory steely for the monks to gather around, reminding everyone, as part of the Christian dogma or teaching, that Jesus triumphed over death through his crucifixion. He did that by rising from the dead, and that's the real reference to the house, the tomb, that's at the top of this. It's with that tomb that we're reminded that Jesus is resurrected, and we Christians, if we follow Jesus, we too can enjoy eternal life in the, the next world. The cross, I think, for us is probably more important today as a reminder of the blending and mixing of traditions, in particular of the ideas of Christianity and the ways in which they are expressed using migrations period style elements. In other words, quite literally a blending of pagan and Christian. To begin with the simplest and the most direct example, this cross, as all crosses in Irish cemeteries are, is oriented east and west. Okay, one side of the cross faces the east, another side of the cross faces the west. On one side, we have an image of the crucified Christ. On the other side, we have the resurrected Christ. Crucified Christ, resurrected Christ, facing east, facing west. You should be working out as you're thinking about this, which of these images would face the West? And the answer is, it is the crucified Christ, the idea of death with the setting sun. The very fact that these are oriented to the sun is pagan in its origin. So we have a Christian cross, but it is oriented to a pagan direction, a traditional direction, essentially, of the sun. The image of the crucified Jesus is located over here. The risen Jesus is located over here. And you'll find in a textbook that as he is shown here, it's also a reference to Judgment Day when he will elevate the, the, the good people, the saved essentially. And he will be a hope for those good people. So underneath him, there's also an image of judgment. And a little bit hard to see in the slide, but it's in there. There's a pair of scales that references Judgment Day. In addition to those pretty obvious examples of blending and mixing and returning to pagan sources, migration sources, for ideas in the design of this, you also pretty clearly have what I would say is sun symbolism. And that occurs in the circle that links the arms of the cross to the shaft of the cross. So this we think is pagan in origin, and it has been blended into a Christian design. Um, where exactly did it come from? Well, there are a number of different sources. We think the most likely origin for the circle actually comes from Scandinavia in the early Middle Ages. In other words, essentially from the Vikings. There are other sources that are potential, but um, we're leaning towards a Scandinavian source. This isn't the only set of pagan influences. Let's see if I can find anything else for us. Uh, these uh, additional examples help us to show, again, how much it is that we owe to migrations, which is pagan, which is barbarian. At least that's what the Romans would have to say about it. Uh, for one thing, we are on the side of the resurrected Christ again, at the very base of this. Okay, resurrected Christ, this is the judgment. Down at the bottom is the reason for Jesus's need to come back and be crucified. And that is an image of, and I've got a detail of it here, Adam and Eve. And this, of course, is Eve with the fruit. And this is a later part of the story, Cain and Abel. That is traditional Christian imagery. Well, going back to the Old Testament, of course. Uh, and... It is not a surprise to find uh, in a Christian context. However, look underneath it, and we've got two beasties that appear to be engaged in a kind of conflict or a battle. Those animals come directly out of Germanic traditions and out of the period of the migrations and migration style in metalwork. Speaking of metalwork, if we turn to the sides of this, 
it is in panels, compartments. The artist is creating decoration, interlaced decoration. It's geometric in nature, but it's tight and it's energized. And this is very, very typical of what we find in metal work. The sides of this, of course, would not be the main areas that we would look at readily. So our artist has decided to fill it with abstract images. One of the key examples of a blending and mixing of pagan imagery and Christian imagery of migrations and Christianity can be found underneath the arm. And that's what I was looking at in that scale shot. I was standing underneath it, looking up at it. So you could certainly do that and look up at the hand of God over your head. So this is the hand of God. You can see it again over here. Behind that hand of God, we have a sun image. The sun in general is a relatively universal image in religion, but it goes way back to the pagan period. So Christianity is mingling and mixing and borrowing with it. We also have two strips of migrations, geometric design, interlace, and compartmentalization, where we're breaking our geometric designs into separate sections or separate regions. What those surround are three heads that have wrapped around them two serpents. The three heads we do believe represents the Trinity. So what we've got here is a Christian depiction, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, an image of the Trinity, but they are encased in, wrapped with uh, two serpents. And serpents are generally not included in Christian iconography because we associate serpents with evil, with Satan, with something tempting Adam and Eve in the garden. Here, however, the serpent is being drawn out of paganism, out of migrations tradition. And in these non-Christian traditions, the serpent is generally considered to be a pretty good creature, one associated with rebirth and renewal. And that again is because of the shedding of the skin of the snake. And that allows people to see new life coming out of old. Uh, my concluding slide on the crosses in Ireland would be a slide that helps us to see that over the course of time and the large 18 foot cross we just looked at is later in time it's around the 11th century uh, these crosses are going to develop they're sometimes going to get bigger but they're also going to take on figurative images in other words we're going to see narratives and human beings and divine beings also depicted on the crosses that's not how they start out this is 11.9a in our textbook it's a South Cross, and it comes from a Henny in Ireland, uh, not that far from the large cross that we just looked at. What I would like you to see in this cross, and it is still substantial, it's around 12 feet, oh, almost close to 13 feet, in fact, but smaller than the other one. It is covered simply with geometric decoration and some bosses, some projections from the surface. It does follow the basic design of an Irish cross, but it is earlier without the narrative depictions of humans. I like this cross because it makes it very easy to see that these carved stone crosses are dependent on metalwork. If you come over here, this is, it's referred to as the Cross of Kong. It is created with a wooden core brass over it and then we have gold and silver on the top of that making it look very elegant and very again very detailed and very busy on the surface it is definitely a christian image but it has also very very clearly been designed following the pattern of migrations metalwork you can see on the surface details of the arm, for example, the compartments, the interlace. You can get a little bit of the idea right here in my larger detail of the twisting, turning, energized lines of interlace. Every inch of the surface is filled. And then my favorite part, 
the shaft of this that would be held by person a person carrying this in <clears throat> procession actually terminates in the head of another beastie. This is that kind of fox-like critter that we saw, very similar to uh, the Terra brooch. It is the metal designs that become the foundation for everything in the migrations period, and that is going to be true also for the Golden Age of Ireland.